I've already uh, traumatized Jed, not by the sermon, but when I told him that I had about 10 errors of theistic evolution I wanted to look at, he suggested that I do about two. <laughs> he may be right. I told you this morning that uh, I got into this because of a discussion on Facebook in the discussion room, chat room, whatever it is, which uh, some members of the church were declaring that uh, theistic evolution was no big deal. They didn't believe it, but uh, it certainly wasn't um, something to be that greatly concerned about. Well, I grant you that I think some people don't even know what theistic evolution is. I'm supposing that they know what macro or organic evolution is. But I want to look at some errors of theistic evolution. I quote this fellow Francis Collins who describes theistic evolution as the position that quote evolution is real but that it was set in motion by God and characterizes it as accepting quote that evolution occurred as biologists describe it but under the direction of God. Theistic evolution, theistic um, evolutionary creation or God guided evolution are views that regard religious teachings about God as compatible with modern scientific understanding about biological evolution now notice that I didn't say that the Bible opposes scientific facts anybody that says that just they don't understand the Bible's in complete harmony with scientific facts and vice versa. But we're talking about a theory to begin with and we're talking about one where people have tried to say well the mechanism God has used to create the world was evolution. Theistic evolution is not in itself a scientific theory but a range of views about how the science of general evolution relates to religious beliefs in contrast to special creation views. In the false theistic evolution system, God is not, let me emphasize that, is not the omnipotent Lord of all things, whose word must be taken seriously by all men. But he is integrated into the evolutionary philosophy. And this leads then to the errors that I want to look at now that we understand what I mean by theistic evolution or theistic evolutionism. The first error, error number one, is the misrepresentation of the very nature of God. The Bible reveals God as our Father in heaven who is perfect, Matthew 5, 48. He is holy, Isaiah 6, verse 3. And he is omnipotent, all-powerful, Jeremiah 32, in verse 17. The apostle John, inspired of the Holy Spirit, tells us that God is love. He also says that he is light, and he also says that God is life, 1 John 4, 16. Also chapter 1, verse 5, John, and uh, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. When, the, when this God, God who is love, light, and life, creates something, then His work, as the inspired Moses described it, is said to be very good, Genesis 1, 31. And again in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4, that it is perfect. But now theistic evolution gives a false representation of the very nature of God, and here's why. Because death and ghastliness of every description are ascribed to the Creator as principles of creation. Now what does that mean? Well, you're familiar with the evolutionary over billions of years, gradual development of whatever it is up through dinosaurs and so forth. 
But have you ever noticed those things are killing and eating one another? Things being blown apart and slaughtered and killed as all of this works. But now the theistic evolution says that's all a part of God's creative power. But when you read Genesis, death of all things entered the world because of sin. But we haven't even got the man yet in the theistic idea of evolution. So you've got all of this going on, and it doesn't fit at all the nature of God and what the Genesis account has to say about it. Error number two. God becomes a God of the gaps. Now, I think probably those who have studied apologetics and the creation and atheism and so forth have heard that term, God of the gaps. The Bible states that God is the prime cause of all things. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, in verse 6, the Apostle Paul penned, But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by Him. However, in theistic evolution, the only workspace allotted to God is that part of nature which evolution cannot explain with the means presently at its disposal. Now, this is why it's called the God of the Gaps. Because what they're saying is, given long enough, there will be a scientific explanation for all things in this physical world. So when you can't explain a thing, then you just put God in there to fill the gaps. He did it. And that's a favorite of of atheist and evolutionary people. So in this way he's reduced to being a god of the gaps of those phenomena about which there are doubts or we just don't know. And this leads to the view that God is therefore not absolute but he himself has evolved. He is evolution. Think about it for a moment. Error number three. Denial of basic biblical teachings. Let me emphasize this before we go into this. Usually when, in fact I'd say every time, that you embrace a certain error concerning God or the Bible or the religion revealed in the Bible, and now I'm thinking of Christianity, it usually doesn't begin and end with just that one error. Usually if you're wrong on one point of such things, it's going to make you wrong on other points because you need to be right on that one to get a proper comprehension of the others. The entire Bible bears witness that we are dealing with a source of truth authored by none other than God. That is the very point of 2 Timothy 3.16. All scriptures given by inspiration of God. God, the first cause, uncaused first cause. God doesn't have a beginning, doesn't have an ending. He is the cause of all things. Thus, Theophanustos, compound word, uh, Theo God, Phanustos, Pneuma, spirit. It's, the scriptures are pictured as breathed out of the very depths of the essence of God, the mind of God. Read 1 Corinthians 2, and you get it explained more about the Holy Spirit being the logical one to reveal the mind of God. And why? Because He is God. So with the Old Testament as the indispensable ramp leading to the New Testament, think of Paul's statement, the law is a schoolmaster bring us unto Christ, Galatians 3.24. It's, it's almost, shall we dare use the term, like an access road to get you to the freeway. Uh, the Old Testament properly understood is going to get you ready for the New Testament. And when you look at the preaching done by the early church, the preaching of the gospel, then they many times started in the Old Testament with the Jews who were thoroughly familiar with it, but many times didn't understand part of it. But remember how that Philip began at Isaiah 53, the Old Testament, and preached to the eunuch Jesus? Well, you can start anywhere that you write by the word of truth, and it's going to lead you to Jesus because that's what it's designed to do. The biblical creation account should not be regarded, as many do, as just a myth, a parable, or an allegory, but as a historical report. Why? Because biological, astronomical, anthropological facts are given 
in teaching form, didactic form. This happened, and I'm telling you about exactly what happened. In the Ten Commandments, God bases the six working days and one day of rest on the same time span as that described in the creation account, Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. In the New Testament, Jesus referred to facts, to the facts of the creation. Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 5, when he's talking about the matter of the creation of man and woman, creation of marriage and home. Nowhere in the Bible are there any indications that the creation account should be understood in any, any other way than as a factual report. If you say, yeah, but I think it otherwise, that's all you've got to go on as you think so. Because there's nothing there in the right division of the word that says that it should be taken in any other way than a factual account. The doctrine of theistic evolution undermines this basic way of reading the Bible as vouched for by Jesus, the prophets, and the apostles. In other words, it's good to read how they read it. It's good to understand, uh, understand and approach it as they did. Events reported in the Bible are reduced to mythological imagery and an understanding of the message of the Bible as being true in word and meaning is, is lost. But when you take it as facts, which it is, you don't run into that problem. These people do this not because they have evidence but because it suits whatever it is they're trying to do. Error number four, loss of the way for finding God. If you read Acts 17 in Paul's sermon on Mars Hill, he's not preaching to Jews of the background in the New Testament. He's preaching to the learned of the Gentile world. And yet he tells them that God's not far from any of us. He basically is saying God wants to be found. But he has made man in such a way as that you need to look for him. And you can understand why you need to look for him. The Bible describes man as being completely uh, ensnared by sin. When Adam and Eve sinned, the door was open for sin to come into the world. Read Romans 7, 18 through 19. And so we need to realize that only those persons who understand the Bible factually are going to accept the teaching of what sin is and when it took place. That it is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4, and it's the only thing that can separate you from God. Now you don't see that in people. People just make light of sin. Well, wouldn't you think the devil would want you to? Since it's the only thing that can separate you from God and if you die in your sins, you're going to wake up in the devil's hell forevermore. So anything the devil can use to make you wink at sin and think it's a joke, then expect it. But he'll do that even in learned circles such as the scholars and so forth with PhDs and there's nothing wrong with studying and learning and a degree. But many things we learn cause us to be like Paul said of some folks, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So only those persons who realize that they are caught up in sin get concerned about it. Look at those Jews who were devout Jews and thinking they were serving God faithfully, but yet when they heard the gospel first preached when the church was established in Acts 2, they heard things they never thought about hearing, proving that they were lost, proving that they had taken, as Peter said, and with wicked hands of crucified and slain the Son of God. Now what impact did it have on them? It convicted them of their sin. They were pricked in their heart by the truth preached to them, Acts 2, verse 37. Thus it caused questions to arise, and one question is, men and brethren, what shall we do to be saved? They were keenly and conscious aware, consciously aware of the fact we're lost. We are devout, religiously lost people, which many people do deny such things exist, but they were. The people on the day of Pentecost, if they had rejected all of that, where else were they going to go? Evolution knows no sin in the biblical sense of missing one's purpose when it comes to his relation to God. Sin is made meaningless, and that is exactly the opposite of what the Holy Spirit does through the word of truth, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Because he declares uh, 
that sin is the worst enemy I have and you have. It's so bad, look what it costs God to make a way for the forgiveness of sins. And it's so bad that if you die in your sins, not taking advantage of the blessing of the gospel and obedience to it in the Christian life, then there's a place called the lake of fire which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, and there all such folks will be consigned. So if sin is seen as a harmless evolutionary factor, then one has lost the very key for finding God, which is not resolved by adding God to the evolutionary scenario, which is what theistic evolutionists are attempting to do by saying God used uh, evolution as the mechanism to create. Error number five. The doctrine of God's incarnation is undermined. The incarnation of God through His Son, Jesus Christ, is, of course, one of the most fundamental and basic teachings of the Bible. The Bible states that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. John 1, 14. And you'll remember in verses 1 and 2 of John, that it declares in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then, too, Paul writing to Philippians in chapter 2, and both verses are three verses, five through seven, declares part of those verses, Christ Jesus was made in the likeness of men. So the idea of evolution undermines the foundation of our salvation. And we need to be aware of that very point. Error number six. The biblical basis of our Lord's work, Jesus' work of redemption is mythologized. The Bible teaches that the first man, Adam, sin, was a real event. Think about it for a minute. Right now, we are in a real event in this assembly. Adam's sin was a real event. When you read about what happened with Eve and how it happened and the partaking of the fruit, and she giving it to Adam and he did eat, that happened just as we're sitting here now. Wherefore is by one man centered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men in that all have sinned. Chapter 5 and verse 12 of the book of Romans. Theistic evolution doesn't acknowledge Adam as the first man, nor that he was created directly from the dust of the ground by God himself, Genesis 2-7. Most theistic evolutionists engage or uh, rather regard the creation account as being a, as I said earlier, a mythical tale, albeit with some spiritual significance, and they usually determine what that is. But the sinner Adam and the Savior Jesus are linked together in the Bible, Romans 5, 16 through 18. Thus, any theological view which mythologizes Adam, guess what? It undermines the biblical basis of Jesus' work of redemption. I pause here to say, these folks who try to say, well, I disagree with it, I think it's wrong, but what's the big problem with it? What do you think now after you've heard this so far? Unless you just say, I don't believe what you said. And that's another point. You can say that. There's a lot of folks who just say that. I understand the words. I understand that's the Bible. I understand that's the Word of God. Don't believe it. Most of the time, we deceive ourselves. We won't say that. We'll come up with some other way. It's sort of like, why weren't you at church on Sunday? Well, rarely are going to say, I don't want to come. There's not many people will say that. They'll come up with some other way, you know, my stump my toe yesterday or whatever. They're not going to say, I didn't want to be there and I wasn't interested, so I didn't come. Those of you who visited wayward members, how many times have they just looked at you and said, well, I know what the Bible says. I know as a Christian I should be there, but I didn't want to come, so I didn't come. Well, I visited a lot of folks who absent themselves from what God's enjoined upon us as an obligation to worship Him in the assembly of the saints on the first day of the week. And I've never had one, but one said that one time, but it wasn't about the assembly. It was just about quitting the, everything about Christianity altogether. I will just simply say about that, but it was a very honest lost person. <coughs> Error number seven, the loss of biblical chronology. I'm surprising uh, Jed because I'm down to seven already. 
The Bible provides us with a time scale for history. I wish we'd let that sink in, a time scale for history. And this underlies a proper understanding of the Bible. God did these things in past time and space as actual, real happenings. And they fit into all the things in the world that has happened, of course. Past time and space, the definition of history. The time scale cannot be extended indefinitely into the past, nor indefinitely into the future. There's a well-defined beginning in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, did he? Was there? Now answer it with the scriptures. Yes, and there was. As well as a moment when physical time will end. Well, how do I know that? Well, if I prove the Bible to be the great word of God, which it is, then it becomes a proof text. And Matthew 24, 14 says there is going to be a definite end of time. I don't know what it's going to be. Maybe the next second. Yeah, that may be the way we don't get through this sermon. No way. And that suits me just fine if it happens. The total duration of creation, according to Exodus 20 and verse 11, was six days. Well, it was or it wasn't. They were days as we know days or they weren't. And there's nothing about the six days of Genesis' account of creation that indicates they were not 24-hour days. Now, that's another sermon or two within itself, but that's the factual statement of Moses. Why make out of it something that one doesn't need to unless you have an agenda? And there's certainly plenty of people with agendas. The age of the universe may be estimated in terms of genealogies recorded in the Bible, but... Um, we can't calculate those exactly, and I'm not saying that we can. But it is in the order of thousands of years old rather than billions and billions and billions of years. Galatians 4 and verse 4 points out the most outstanding event in the world's history. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son. Now that happened 2,000 years ago about. So there's specific times in past time and space that things happen. And as time goes on until it ends, there'll be a certain time in God's mind that it ought to end right here. And that's when it's going to end. The return of Christ in power and glory, I would have to say, is the greatest expected future event. And it's going to catch most people by surprise especially those who think that the Genesis account of creation is myth. For if they didn't look at that as a reality and a statement of facts, why should they look at the future coming of Christ at the end of time as a fact either? Supporters of theistic evolution and progressive creation disregard the biblically given measures of time in favor of of evolutionist time scales involving billions of years both past and future of which there are no convincing physical grounds. This can lead to at least two errors. Not all statements of the Bible are to be taken seriously. And vigilance concerning the second coming of Jesus may be lost. Why shouldn't we think that way since we're trying to marry God with evolution by saying that's the mechanism he uses, and yet the mechanism itself fails in view of who God is and as he reveals himself. Error number eight, the loss of creation concepts. Certain essential creation concepts are taught in the Bible, and these include... God created matter without using any available material. Fiat creation. Light be light was is the actual rendering of let there be light and there was light. That's the way it reads in the Hebrew. Light be light was. God created the earth first and on the fourth day he added the moon, the solar system, our local galaxy, and all other star systems. 
The sequence conflicts with all ideas of cosmic evolution, such as the Big Bang cosmology is expressed by scientists. So there we are. It's either accept the Bible for what it is, or else make it in such a way as it doesn't mean what it says. But error nine. And this ties in with some of the other things we said, the misrepresentation of reality. You know, people who aren't in contact with reality, and nobody, uh, unless he's dead, gets completely out of, or unconscious, out of contact with reality. But people that are having problems being in contact with reality uh, are at different degrees of insanity. <laughs> That's what happens. The Bible carries the seal of truth. And if it doesn't, there's not anything true. And all its pronouncements are authoritative. Whether they deal with questions of faith and salvation, uh, our daily living, or matters of scientific importance. And if you look at a rank atheist such as Richard Dawkins, they will laugh at folks trying to be theistic evolutionists. If evolution is false, then numerous sciences have embraced a false testimony, and evolution is false, so they've embraced a false testimony. Whenever these sciences conform to evolutionary views, guess what they're doing? They're misrepresenting reality. Think about that a little bit. When you embrace error, when you believe what's false, you're denying reality on whatever those things are dealing with. How much more than a theology which departs from what the Bible says and embraces evolution? When people teach doctrines contrary to the doctrine of Christ, how to become a Christian, what the church is, its work, organization, worship, then they're teaching that which is not real. That's a lie, you know. And I know what Revelation 21.8 says about there's a place pointed for all liars, a lake which burns with fire and brimstone. Well, as an evolution advocate and a theistic evolutionist, are they liars? Well, if they're not, it has to be they're teaching the truth. Now, who wants to affirm that they're teaching the truth? But more than that, who wants to affirm it and then try to prove it? Well, if it's not the truth, there is only one other alternative. No, no other way. It's a lie. Then the tenth one, surprise, Jed. Era number ten, missing the purpose. In no other historical book do we find so many and such valuable statements of purpose for man as we do in the Bible. For example, man is God's purpose in creation. Genesis 1, 27 through 28. Let me pause here and say, if you want to cause people to realize how valuable they are, how important they are, then go to the Bible and see what God says about them and read what the Creator says about them. But now, if you want to just think of yourself as a hairless, improved ape, I can tell you where you know, need to go read, and that's evolution. You're just that. But man is the purpose of God's plan of redemption, Isaiah 53, 5. Man is the purpose of the mission of God's Son, 1 John 4, 9. We are the purpose of God's inheritance, Titus 4, 3, 7. Heaven is our destination, 1 Peter 1, verse 4. Do you think you're special? Do you think you're important? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That's because man was in sin. That's the only way man could be saved. Does that say that man is far above anything else in this world? God has a special place for a man when this world's over, if he'll be faithful to him here. The very thought of purposefulness is a curse to the evolutionist. He does not think that man is any more special than a snail darter or a whale. Do you see why there's no problem with the true evolutionists in aborting thousands upon thousands of babies any more than you're cracking an egg of a hen and cooking with it? You see, we try to say, how can they do this? They don't think like you do. They don't have a philosophy that you do. 
They don't have the word of God guiding your view. They don't have the, creation, the creator's idea of a human being made a little older than the angels. They don't see the speciality of man. He's just a part of an evolutionary process. In fact, they'll even speculate that the human race may vanish off the earth someday and some other animal come up and take over. And that's the reason people act the way they do. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And that's the reason they do that. Thus, a belief system such as theistic evolution that marries purposefulness with non-purposefulness is a contradiction in terms. And I would say if you don't get anything else out of all these errors, that's one. That would make it wrong just all by itself. So what are we to conclude? The doctrines of creation and evolution are so strongly divergent that reconciliation is totally impossible. And I'm sorry there are those who want to claim to believe in the God of the Bible and Christ is their Savior and the Bible is the Word of God and yet they still try to hook God and evolution together. So the conclusion is inevitable. There is no support for theistic evolution in the Bible any more than there is for organic or macro evolution that the atheist believes in. Now, I realize you're not going to run across these folks every day, but they're there. I know that J.D. mentioned a teacher. In fact, let me borrow a book that uh, he wrote trying to say this was all right, it's okay. And it uh, didn't take long reading it to know the and I mean it's kindly, but you know, saying it kindly doesn't take away the fact of the matter. You know what he's talking about. Now, does that mean I know everything there is to know about all this? I, I don't have to know everything there is to know about a matter to know enough about it to know it's contrary to God, to Christ, the Bible, and Christianity. That's the reason there are other errors you could find. These are basic that you could find. I just said these are some errors. We need to be careful. We need to take time to think. And above all, we need to know the proofs of God's existence, the deity of Christ, that the Bible is the inerrant, the all-sufficient, the final, complete revelation of God to man. That we're to study it because God made us to be able to comprehend it. And He accommodated our rational intellectual powers by revealing his mind to us on our level of understanding and the way that we understand. And we need to know the devil is wanting to turn us against the word of God every way he can. And the best thing that he can do and the only thing he can do, many ways he may do it, is to get us away from the truth of the Bible. And what we've studied today is one of the ways he tries to do it. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, we implore you by the mercies of Christ to realize the brevity and uncertainty of life, how quickly we're going to be leaving this world, no matter how long we may live on it, and that there's going to be an end to all things material someday. The Lord's going to come back and judge the world in righteousness, and each one of us must stand before the judgment bar of Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. So we want to be prepared when that time comes. Believing that He is the Son of God, repenting of our sins and confessing our faith in Him, being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, whereby the Lord adds us to the church, and we can live faithful to Him in it. As a child of God, if you sin, you brought reproach upon the church by a public action that's contrary to God's will, that is sin. And we urge you to repent of it in the same way. Come confessing those sins. We'll pray with you and for you. And if you need then to come to Jesus, we ask you to come while we stand and sing.